This part of the session, I would like to describe how I believe pointers could be introduced to our students. By now, the students would have understood that there are memory locations which are tagged by the names that we give them and that these locations form a sequence of consecutive places where values can be kept. We would now like to emphasize to them that while we normally deal with the values stored inside these locations, the location addresses also can be deployed meaningfully. Use of these addresses of the locations and the values therein has been handled traditionally in C, C++ at an extremely low level. And that is the reason why pointers are predominantly used in C, used less in C++ and not used at all in languages such as Java. Many puritanical programmers consider the use of pointers as a very dangerous thing. However, pointers and pointer arithmetic forms the very crux of many good programs that have been written. Your power to write programs, of course, sometimes the programs become unreadable. In general, in C++, C++ you can not avoid using pointers. There are certain simple things also which cannot be done without pointers and therefore understanding pointers is a necessary evil. In particular, when I want to pass parameters in functions by reference, I need to use pointers. So we'll see one example of this. And input-output functions in C, C++, such as scanf, will necessarily require a pointer. The way I like to introduce pointers to students is to tell people that memory consists of many locations. Each location has a unique address. Usually, the address inside the machine starts with zero. The smallest unit of addressable memory is a byte. That means you can address individual bytes. For numerical values, we use larger locations which are made out of composite bytes. If you put two bytes together, four bytes together, eight bytes together, and you get a larger location. Now, if you consider int, float, and char variable types and arrays, and have a declaration int m, float a3, char c4, assume that you have assigned these values, 573 to m, some 673.852 to a0, some very small value to a1, some very large value to a2, and you have assigned individual characters u, n, i, x to c0, c1, c2, c3. Please note, I am not talking about a string here, so don't search for a backslash 0. These are just arbitrary assignments made here to demonstrate the notion of a pointer. Now, if these variables are listed, and if we assume that these have been allocated consecutive location in the memory, what internally will happen is something like this. Suppose the first location is allocated at the address 10,000. Then the addresses of all locations will follow like this. The location 10,000 will contain the value of m. Since an integer is ordinarily allocated 4 bytes, the next available location address will be 10,004, which will be given to A0. Now, A0 is a floating point element. It also requires 4 bytes. Next element is 10,008. Subsequent is 10,012, etc. At this 10,012, I have the element A2, which contains this large value, and it is 4 bytes long. The next element is addressed at 10,016. This then will become the address of the element C0, which contains U. However, this is a char array, so it requires only one byte, and therefore the address of the next location is 10,070. These then are the addresses, and these are the names. Now, this is what happens internally, and we should emphatically tell our students that ordinarily we have nothing to do with these addresses. We deal only with the name and the corresponding value. However, it is possible to deal with these addresses, which are actually pointers to memory location, because they point to specific memory location. Now, 10,000 is thus an address pointing to m, which is an int type. 
10,012 is an address pointing to A2, which is a float type. 10,016 is an address pointing to C0. 10,017 is an address pointing to C1. What is important to emphasize to our students right at the beginning that while the addresses simply look numerical and therefore exactly similar in nature to us, they are not. Internally, C++ makes a great distinction between a pointer which points to an integer value and a pointer which points to a floating point value and a pointer which points to a character type value. Ordinarily, we do not deal with these pointers at all. We use names and value. But C++ permits us use of pointers within a program. A location address can be found and stored as a pointer and contents of such address can be accessed and used. Notice that as I said, we normally deal with these names. The first question is, if a pointer is defined as an address to a location, given the name of the location, how do I find an address? And where do I store that address? The corresponding reverse problem is, given the address stored in some appropriate variable which we do not know how, but given an address, how to find the corresponding value? The corresponding value which is located inside this name M. These are the issues with which the pointers deal with. So for example, consider the location name M. Its address in our example is 10,000. Value of M is 573. Now value at address 10,000 is 573. So even if there was no name M, if you knew the address, you can relate it to the content 573. Of course, we deal with M. As I said, we require two possible operations. Given a name, what is its address? Given an address, what is the corresponding value stored in that location? These two are made available to us by the operator AND and the operator STAR. Note that the, the op uh, symbol STAR is used as multiplication operator in arithmetic expression. Symbol AND is used in our logical expression. But in a standalone fashion, associated with something that we shall shortly see, these stand for operators dealing with addresses and their contents. And is called the address operator. When it precedes any name, it returns the address of that name. Star is called dereferencing operator. Whenever it precedes a name, it actually gives us the value contained in the address referred by name. For example, and m will give us the address of m. Star p will give us contents of the location whose address is stored in p. Now, what is p? Is p an arbitrary integer variable? Because we think that addresses are simply numbers and they can be stored in integer variables. The answer is a plain no. And this must be told to our students emphatically. That while the addresses are numerical values, C, C++ does not permit us to deal with these addresses as plain numerical values. If at all we want to extract an address and use it, even numerically for doing some operations as we shall see, it must be stored in specially defined variables called pointer variables. How do I get an address if I have a variable p which is a pointer variable? I simply say p equal to and m. Notice that the and operator will get us the address and this address will get stored in p. How do we declare p and how, how does it hold an address? So here are some examples. There is a special type called pointer type and I can say int star p. Why do not I say pointer p simply? The reason is, as I said, C++ distinguishes pointers of different types. That means pointers which point to names of different types. So a pointer which pointing to an integer variable, a pointer which is pointing to a floating point variable, a pointer which is pointing to a cal type variable are all considered separate types of pointers. And the simplest way to define a pointer since every pointer is always associated with a type, C++ has decided, has designed a mechanism by which you write the type and then you write a simple star 
followed by the pointer variable name. It means that you are defining a pointer which points to variable of that type. So here is an example. Int star p defines name p to have a type int star, which means it's a pointer of the value type int. Please note that p itself is an address, so it's actually a numerical value. But can I say p equal to, let's say, 1 lakh 12,000? The answer is no. This is a wrong thing. Because while p is, contains a numerical value, it is not an arbitrary numerical value that we can assign. It has to be a valid address of one of the variables or array elements in your program. And that valid address must be calculated by C, C++ only. You and I cannot do that because we simply don't know what any address of a location is. And this can be found by saying P is equal to and M. So only such an assignment can permit us to get a value for P. Of course, once we get a valid address, there are numerical operations which are possible on P, which we shall see shortly. Here is a code, M, M N in star P. M is equal to 25. This is a normal assignment. M is an integer variable. P is equal to and M. This means the address of M is assigned to P. N is equal to star P plus 3. This is a valid statement. Why? 3 is a value. P is a pointer, but star P is a value. Remember, star is a dereferencing operator. So star P actually means the value contained in the location pointed to by P. This is nothing but M, whose address we got it here. Since the value of M is 25, star P is replaced by 25. 25 plus 3 is 28. So you get this value. We can declare pointers for any data type. So I have int star P1, float star P2, char star P3. This will allocate separate memory locations for these three pointers. As I said, each can contain an address which ordinarily itself is a 32-bit number. So the address can be a very large value between 0 to 2 to the power 31 minus 1. When I write P1 is equal to and M, where M has a value 573, P1 will be assigned what value? P1 will be assigned the value which is address of M. What is the value of star P1? The value of star P1 is the value contained in M, which is 573. So here is an example. If I print the value of M using C out star P1, I will get actually 573. We can also print the value of pointer itself, which is meaningless to us ordinarily. Suppose I say C out P1, I will actually get the address contained in P1. And in fact, whenever you ask C out to print the value of a pointer variable, it will print it in hexadecimal. Because it knows that it's not a meaningful value to your program, it's an address which is internal. We can actually increment the value of a pointer. For example, if we say P2 is equal to and A0, notice that this is an address operator. A is an array. So the address of the zeroth element of array is stored in P2. Now when I say P2 plus plus, P2 will not increase by one, but it will increase by as many bytes as are associated with the type of array A. Since that type requires four bytes, the address will be advanced by four bytes. Why? Because when we say P2++, the implicit understanding of C++ compiler is that you now want the pointer to point to the next element of this array. And the next element of this array is four bytes away, not one byte away. Now this is automatically handled by the compiler. You and I don't have to do anything. Now if I say C out less less star P2, it will print the value of A1 because P2 has been advanced by four bytes because of this instruction. Here is an example program. I declare M and A3 is a three element array. I assign 573 to M and some minus something something value to M. I define two pointers, integer type pointers because all of these are integers. PTR1, PTR2. I, I have assigned the values of M and N. I just print them out just for confirmation. I will get M as 573. N as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6. I do what I just demonstrated. I extract the address of M, store it in PTR1. Now PTR2 is also a pointer. To PTR2, I assign a value PTR1 plus 1. Please note that these pointers are in type. Since integer requires 4 bytes, PTR2 will have a value which is 4 greater than PTR1. 
since I have declared M followed by N followed by A3, I would now expect that PTR2 points to N if PTR1 was pointing to M. I try first to print the value of the pointers PTR1 and PTR2 and then I try to print the corresponding values which are pointed to by these pointers by saying star PTR1 and star PTR2. If I execute this program, this is what would happen. The value of M and N is this and this. The pointers have these two values. These are the values which are returned by what you call in hexadecimal by C++. The corresponding data values are 573 and minus something, 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 something. Why is that? Why are we not getting the right value of N? That is because N need not be located 4 bytes away from M. There is no guarantee that the compiler would do that. The only guarantee compiler gives is when I have in as a pointers pointing to array element because array elements are only always allocated consecutive location. The correct way to deal with two different values m and n is extract the address of m separately by an AND operator, extract the address of n separately by an AND operator. Now if I print these, I will get the right values of uh, uh, values pointed to by those pointers, namely the value of m and n. These kind of explanations I have found very useful to the students who otherwise get lots of confusion in the case of pointers. What is important to tell them is that if you are dealing with arrays, then pointers which have successive values of that particular type will always point to successive elements of an array and that is because array elements are always allocated successive locations. So if I output A0, A1, A2 and I assign address of A0 to pointer 1, I add 1 to it to get pointer 2, I add 2 to it to get pointer 3 and then I print the pointer values and then I print the data values which are pointed to by them by saying star PTR1, star PTR2 and star PTR3, observe what I will get as output. The actual values are these. Pointers have these values and the corresponding data values are the same as these. Notice that the pointers which are printed by my program, those of you who can easily read hexadecimal, this value ends in 5C and this value is 6,0, is exactly 4 bytes away from here. This value is, ends in 6,4, is exactly 4 bytes away from here. It confirms that C, C++ will always allocate consecutive locations to elements of an array. Of course, the consecutive locations will not be one byte away. They will be as many bytes away as are required to represent one value of that type. So this is floating point type or integer type. These will be four bytes away. As I said, this is merely an introduction to the pointers. There is much more to the pointers. The more important things are to talk about passing parameters to function. Ordinarily, when we deal with functions, initially we tell them about passing parameters by value. So for example, when we pass, when we write a function f with a parameter int x and a parameter int y, and we call it in our program by saying c is equal to f of a, b, we presume that a goes to x, b goes to y, the function is calculated, and I get the sum returned back here, which is assigned to C. Does the value of A and B change? Well, it does not, because this method of parameter passing actually copies a value. Let me skip this example. This is a very simple example. The point is, when we invoke the function swap, the values of X and Y are copied and sent to the function. So even if the function swaps these or changes the value, the change is not reflected in the original value. Since those values are not copied back, only one copy is sent. Now, if we want to tell the function that if you change the parameter which I have sent, don't change your local copy, but change me, then by mentioning me as a parameter is not adequate. What I have to do is, when I call the function, I tell the function that, look, 
I am not giving you a value, but I am giving you a pointer. So whatever you do with that variable, I will get changed because that pointer is pointing to my address. This is what is known as pointing, calling by reference. If I pass the parameter as a star, as an and, as an address, then I will get an updated thing. The array names are always passed as addresses or pointers. That means whenever I pass an array name as a parameter, it automatically treats that array name as the pointer to zeroth element of the array. That is the reason why when an array is passed as a parameter to any function and in that function if modify the value of any element of that array, that change is reflected in the calling program. Because what has gone out there is not a copy, but what has gone out there is a pointer to the array. And therefore, changes happen there. Okay, here is that example. I say int uh, main whatever, swap and x and y. And the swap function is written as int star a int star b. So whenever I exchange a and b, it reflects back onto x and y, and x and y gets changed. The I/O functions in C++, remember I said on the very first day that it is scary to explain and scary for students to understand the use of AND in a scanf. But once we define the pointers and tell them how pointers work, we will see that it is very easy to explain the function scanf particular. The parameters, to, this is an explanation for scanf and printf, I am not going into those details, but what is important to say, it is the printf function, but let's look at the scanf function. The scanf needs to be passed pointers to the argument. Why? Because when we call scanf function, it actually collects a value from the input and inserts it into the variable. Now, if that variable was merely a copy, that value remains inserted there. We want that value back. So therefore, the parameter that we give is an address parameter. So for example, and var, variable 1, and variable 2, etc., is the way to call scanf. So here is an example. In the scanf, when I say and x and y, then whatever value is read by scanf is given to me as value of x and value of y. Therefore, when I say c out, I will get actually the input value. Why am I not using an AND operator here? Simply because it is not necessary. Name is an array and by convention C++ always passes as a parameter the address of the name uh, of the array name. Therefore, if I read something here, it will automatically reflect in this variable. This is the essence of pointer. There are a lot more things that you can do with pointers. Sadly, there are many programmers who write very difficult to understand code by using only pointers. So for example, it is fashionable or it was fashionable at one time among C programmers to not to use arrays with their indexes. So instead of writing CI, they would write star C plus I because star C is a pointer, I is an index. Now, this might make sense to a tricky and in their ways elegant programming I personally consider that as poor programming because a program which cannot be understood by another human reader easily is a poorly written program in the modern context where programs are increasingly written by someone and used and modified by someone else. I do not have the privilege of writing programs for my own sake. I always write programs which will be shared. So good coding practice should mean that you should not try to use such tricks. But what is important is to understand that pointers are extremely critical and important. A few things such as parameter passing by reference cannot be done without pointers. And of course, they can be used for some elegant coding practices. Here is another example of scanf where an input data line contains this. So notice that there is no blank space here. Observe that all the while we are shouting at C in that without a separation of a blank, I cannot read anything. But the scanf can read the entire character string. And the scanf has the ability to extract portions of that string based on the format that I prescribe. 
I suggest that we take the tea break now.